<laughs> I heard the chuckles on that. That was good. Hey, it is so good to have every one of you with us today. And right now we have many who are joining us online as well. So if you're in the room with me, would you join me in welcoming our online community? <laughs> good to have every one of you with us. And if you live in the Owasso area, hopefully you can come and join us soon right here. So uh, we invite you to, to be a part of that. Uh, and I just want to say a happy 4th of July. This is one of those years where it falls right on a Sunday. <laughs> so we're really glad you all are here in the, in the room with us right now. But uh, we hope everybody has a wonderful 4th of July Independence Day celebration as we celebrate our nation and our freedom. And um, be sure to uh, keep all your digits, okay? So just be safe. Uh, I was up here uh, last night working on my messages, going over it, and uh, uh, there were fireworks going off in all the surrounding neighborhoods while I was in here, just like echoing in this room. And I'm sure every one of them was legal uh, in their neighborhoods, but uh, some of them were pretty big, I can tell you that. But anyway, hopefully everybody has a great celebration, okay? Hey, uh, today we are starting a new series called Mixtape, and uh, we're excited about this series. And when we say mixtape, many of you know exactly why or what we're talking about. Others of you are going, huh, well, you, you got a little glimpse in the sermon bump, but uh, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you made them just like I did, all right? You, you made those uh, mixtapes. You put all your favorite songs on there, and uh, you, you, you went through all the effort. You had the dual cassette player, and you got them all timed up and just hit that record button and play button at the same time. You know, you did that. Or if you were cheap like me, you recorded them off the radio. Yeah, there's some of you. Yeah, you uh, you listened, and whenever they would announce next song coming up, da da da, da you know, it's like oh yo, <laughs> oh, yes, and you try to time it where you don't get the announcer very much, and you know all the song, and yeah, you were there, you did it, and uh, so and then you would you would begin, you'd build your your mixtape with all your favorite songs, and uh, of course we would make them for all the different moods and all the different occasions, right? And so you would have your workout mixtape or your pre-game mixtape. And you put it in your Walkman, put on the headphones, rah, you know, and you're getting fired up, getting ready to go, you know, you're heading to the bus, getting ready to head down to the, you know, opponent's uh, place. And, you know, you know, you're there. You did, some of you did that. Uh, or, or there's the other end of the spectrum. You had your lonely, your lonely mix, right? The uh, I just got dumped mix, <laughs> you know, all the sad so journey. <laughs> you cry in your car, you listen, you know, your heart was broke. You know, you had, you had your lonely one. You had your good time ones, you know, all the fun, you know, music, fast paced. Yeah, all my friends are having a good time. Or your cruising mix, right? You all have your cruise mix, especially if you had subwoofers. You had the bass thumping, a little Run DMC, Jam Master J, yeah, you know, anyway, all that good stuff. Anyway, and you can probably fill in lots of other moods and occasions that you made mixtapes, you know, your country tape and all that stuff. Anyway, um, but once you've finished your masterpiece, you had all the songs on there, you weren't done yet until you, number one, put on your label, Right? Put on your label, right on there. Maybe you were one of those meticulous types that you wrote every little song and you crammed all those words on there, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. You cram it. Or maybe you just labeled it, you know, game, game day. That was it. Put that label on there. And then the last step. I ran this by some people this morning and they totally forgot about this step. You break out the tabs. Anybody remember that? You break out the tabs so you don't accidentally record over your masterpiece, your mix, man. You worked hard on that thing, and you didn't want to accidentally record over it, right? So you would, you know, break those out. Of course, if you ever changed your mind, what did you do? You put tape over them. And the technology in these things is amazing, all right? So, um, so we went from mixtapes to some of you did mix CDs, not as cool, but yeah, same kind of thing. And then um, from there, now we have playlists. How boring are playlists? I mean, you just go to click, 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 label. Now I got it. You know, I mean, that's just, that's no fun. This dominates. All right, anyway. Um, 
So mixtape. <laughs> some of you are late. Some of you remember. Some of you think I'm just old, but that's okay. Uh, so this series, as we are talking about mixtape, um, we're really not talking about mixtapes, but we are talking about some songs. And we're going to be going through some key chapters in the book of Psalms. Why? Because Psalms is a book of songs. The, the original Hebrew title to the book of Psalms literally means songs of praise. The word we have today, the English word that we use today is psalms, which means praise songs, all right? So, so it's a book of songs written by, uh, composed, many of these songs composed by various different authors, all compiled into one book, song book, hymn book, whatever you want to call it, a book of songs. And it was a book, all these songs, many of them were put to music, okay? And the Israelite people, the Jewish people would sing these songs together. Oftentimes they would sing them while they were traveling. Maybe they'd be traveling, traveling to Jerusalem to one of the many celebrations that they would be going to, and they would sing these songs together as a people. For a number of reasons, uh, one re thing is this, it, it, they were a reminder of their heritage, of who they were as a people. Many of these songs spoke to their heritage or their traditions, and so they would sing these songs, and, and the generations would sing them, and, and that way the heritage traditions would be passed down from generation to generation. But more importantly than that, they were saying to remember their God and all the things that God meant to them as a people and has he established them as a people. And so, uh, uh, so we read through the Psalms and we get a glimpse into, into uh, the Jewish people, the Jewish heritage, and most importantly, to the Jewish God, our God, who we still worship today. Okay, so today we're going to actually just start in Psalm chapter 1, uh, because I think that's a good place to start, all right? Because uh, Psalm chapter 1 really lays the scene, or, or as one commentator called it, says this is the preface for the remaining 149 songs to follow. And so <clears throat> it's somewhat like the label that we would put on our mixtape. You know, they, they have compiled, the, they, somebody compiled all these together into one book, and then they wrote, put together Psalm chapter 1 and said, okay, let's write down all the different things, some of the main moods and, and occasions that are represented within the rest of the book. And so, so we're going to start with Psalm chapter 1 today. And the writer of Psalm chapter 1 begins by laying out for us the difference between the blessed life and the unblessed life, the blessed life versus the unblessed life, and, and lays it out for us, the differences between the two. Now, when we begin to talk about the blessed life, our minds begin to go, right? We, we all have different ideas of what the blessed life looks like. Why? Because we all grew up in different uh, eras and, and times and places, and we had different influences that spoke to us and helped us to develop an idea of a blessed life. All kinds of things in this world and in our lives have influenced us to, to recognize or what we believe to be the blessed life. Things like TV shows have influenced us to determine, well, what is the blessed life? What does the blessed life look like? Maybe you grew up watching the show, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, you watch these twins growing up in their hotel suite, and they had everything, right? I mean, all the food they would want, and I mean, it was a sweet life, right? And uh, so that would be awesome, you know? And if I remember right, and some of you can help me on this, if I, they went from the sweet life to like the sweet life on deck, yeah, because they moved to the cruise ship. How much sweeter could you get than living on a cruise ship? I mean, Non-stop buffet lines all the time. Anyway, um, there you go. But let's go back just a little bit further. And I know these uh, reruns are still out there, but maybe you watched MTV Cribs. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, they would go into these mega stars, artists' homes, and they, they uh, go in and do the tour of all the, their huge mansions and their huge closets and their huge pools and, and then their car collections and, and just all the things, their shoe collection, all the things they have. And you sit there and you watch all these things and you go, wow, that's awesome. That's blessed. You know, you probably wouldn't say that. That would be weird. But anyway, uh, but it just, it just speaks to a little bit of that idea of, man, that's, they've got it all, right? Okay, let's rewind just a little bit further. Actually, quite a bit further. Okay, maybe you grew up watching the Andy Griffith show. Yeah. I did. I mean, I grew up watching Andy Griffith. Matter of fact, every once in a while, I still turn on reruns of Andy Griffith. All right? and, and you'd watch that, and you'd like, man, what a... What a life. Mayberry. I mean, does it get any better? I mean, this wonderful, beautiful, quiet little town. That would be awesome. Maybe that's a little bit of your idea of the blessed life. But we all get this ideal in our head of what a blessed life looks like. And then we say things like, if I ever strike it rich, if I ever make it big, then I'm going to buy this, go there, do that, and then. I'll be blessed, right? Then my life will be blessed. We all have a different idea of what the blessed life really looks like. And we all chase after our own definition of the blessed life. We do. It's what we go after. It's what we work towards. It's what we desire. It's what we dream of. The blessed Life, And so in Psalm chapter 1, the writer there begins by painting us a picture of the true blessed life. As he lays it out next to the unblessed life. So we're going to start in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to walk through this. If you have your Bibles, follow along. If not, it'll be on the screen, but let's start there. It says this. Blessed is the man. Let me stop right there, okay? Blessed is the man. This is actually an emphatic statement, and it could really be saying, how blessed, oh, how blessed is this guy. He is so blessed, all right? Literally, the word blessed means happy. He is so happy. This person is so blessed, so happy. Who walks not in the counsel of the wicked? Now, stop there. All the first things that he mentions are all in the negative sense. These are the things that a blessed person doesn't do. Okay? So, back up again. Okay? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers. Okay? So, let's start here. He walks not in the counsel of the wicked. He does not listen to wicked people. Okay? I'm kind of flipping the word wicked today to un unblessed, okay? Kind of the same thing, just playing off of the whole blessed idea. But we don't listen to, or the blessed person doesn't listen to people who are not like-minded, biblically-minded, with a biblical worldview. Blessed people do not listen to those kind of people, nor do they stand in the way of sinners. Now, you read that statement at first blush, and sometimes you think, well, he doesn't stand in the way of sinners. Isn't that a good thing? Like... I'm standing in your way. You cannot sin. That kind of the idea you get at first, but it's really not what it's saying. No, he doesn't stand in the way. He doesn't live in the way of sinners. He doesn't do the things of sinners. He doesn't engage in things that are against what God desires in his life. The blessed person does not engage in a sinful lifestyle, nor do they sit in the seat of scoffers, scoffers, mockers, some versions say. Mouth off is kind of a literal translation. Have you ever seen somebody, or maybe you've been this person, standing behind somebody, somebody's talking, somebody's saying something, and somebody else is behind them going, you know, mocking, okay, making, a mouth, mouthing them, okay, that's the idea. Making fun of God, mocking God and the people of God. The blessed person doesn't sit in that seat, doesn't do that. That's not the blessed person. 
So the writer starts with all these things that the blessed person doesn't do. But then in verse 2, he shifts gears and says, no, this is what the blessed person does. Look at verse 2 with me. It says this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He delights in the law of the Lord. What do you delight in? Literal translation of the word delight is to savor. Today's the 4th of July. <laughs> I imagine today we will be savoring something. Yes. Off of the grill, out of the smoker, wherever, you know. Or maybe it's the homemade ice cream on this hot day and you savor that. You delight in that. Maybe, maybe you think of when you think of delighting in something, you delight in just being next to a mountain stream, that just peaceful sound and the beauty of nature. And you just delight. Maybe, maybe it's just it's holding the hand of the person you love, being near to the person that you love, and just you delight in that. The blessed person delights in the law of the Lord. What's the law of the Lord? For the Jewish people, as they would sing this song and they would hear this text, they would be thinking of the books of the law. Okay? Go back to the, the beginning of the Old Testament and those books that they would have, and they would, they would delight in that. They would study it. They would memorize. Many would memorize many of the books of the law before they were like 12 years old. I mean, was, they would, they'd study it. They wanted to know it, but that's what they'd be thinking about. For us today, it would not be wrong for us to, to include in the, the, the law of the Lord to be all of what we have today as the Word of God. That's what it's speaking to, that we would delight in the Word of God, God's Word, the Bible that we have today, His Word that has been given to us. And so a blessed person delights in the Word of God. And on His law, he meditates day and night. What meditate speaks to is intentionality. That, that there's specific time set aside for, for study of God's Word, to, to read God's Word, to, to take in God's Word, and then to begin to apply God's Word into our life as we delight in it, as we study after it. And so this, these are some of the things, this is the biggest thing, really, that the blessed person does, delighting in the Word of God and meditating on it. And right here in verse 3, this is where he shifts gears again and he says, let me illustrate this for you. Let me illustrate for you what a blessed life looks like that meditates on God's word and delights in God's word. Follow with me here. It says this, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and, and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. He's like a tree that's planted. Not just like a tree that just pops up somewhere out in the forest. No, this one's been planted. This one's been placed somewhere that God desires for us to plant our life in a specific place, a specific time that we can gain nutrients that we need from his word. This is an illustration of God's word as it works in us. And so we are a tree to be a tree planted. Now, the idea here in, in uh, the Jewish time and in the Jewish culture in the area that was very dry, it would be uh, very common for farmers to actually dig streams to get water to where it needed to go to be able to irrigate their crops and to be able to irrigate their trees so that they would produce the fruit that they needed to produce. And that's the idea, the terminology that's used in here is that, hey, there's a lot of intentionality into this. God has prepared his word for us that if we'll plant our life in that, We'll receive from it the life-giving nutrients that we need. And that goes into what he keeps on talking about. Streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Okay? Where our life is, when we have God's word coming into us, it should yield fruit in our life. Our life should change. Our life should look different. And our life should make a difference in this world. And that, in, that idea of in season, that whenever I face circumstances in life, when there is, uh, should be a specific response in my life, it just comes out. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, self-control. Those things, uh, in Galatians 5.22, those things should, when I face a circumstance, those should be the fruit that come out of my life. Because why? Because I've been delighting in and meditating on God's Word that's been feeding me and preparing me for that moment, for that circumstance. So we produce fruit in season. And the blessed person also 
Its leaf does not wither. Picture there is that as we face the fires of this world, the heat from this world, the circumstances that, that tend to bear down on us, our leaf won't wither. As we feed on God's word and we're getting the nourishment and satisfaction from God's word, we won't dry up. We remain strong. In all that he does, he prospers. Now, in our Americanized thinking, we see that word prospers, and we think, well, yeah, we're going to get rich. <laughs> God's going to bless us, and we're going to have lots of money. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, some people, God does bless in that way, and they do prosper in that way as they pursue after God, and they're able to use their life and their resources for God's purpose in a great way. But for others, prosper isn't a financial thing. It's just you have a life of joy, of hope, of happiness. You're able to press on through whatever comes in your life. Because the blessed life is not about circumstances, okay? Get, 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 let me hear you. Let, let, let me stop here. It's not about as long as my circumstances are good, life is good and life is blessed. No. The blessed life is no matter the circumstances, I'm good and I prosper because my God is taking care of me. He is providing for me and I have the hope and the joy that he gives me. That is the blessed life. I don't engage in all those other things in verse 1. But I do engage in God's word, and because I engage in him, I walk with him in this relationship. I can walk through this life with all that I need to handle anything that might come my way. That's blessed. But at this point, verse 4, he shifts gears again. He goes from talking about the blessed life to begin talking about the unblessed life or the wicked life. Those who are not with God, for God, living God's way. Look at verse 4 with me. It says this. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. So he just spent three verses talking about the blessed life, describing the blessed life, what it's not, what it is, and everything. And he takes all that and he says, now the wicked person, the unblessed person, the person not living out God's way, is not like that. Matter of fact, he's, he's the opposite of all those things. So all those negative thoughts or negative comments about a blessed person in verse 1, that describes the wicked person, the unblessed person. So go back to verse 1 again. Let's look at that and see what and how he describes the unblessed person with that little statement. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Well, what, what do the wicked do? What do the unblessed do? They do walk in the counsel of the wicked. They do listen to those they shouldn't listen to, who don't have a biblical worldview. Nor stands in the way of sinners. What does the unblessed person do? They, they do live their life the way a sinner would live their life. They do things that are against God. Nor sits in the seat of scoffers. The unblessed person sits in that seat. And can come to a place in their life when they're far enough away from God that they truly do mock God and scoff at God and God's people. That's the description that he gives for the unblessed person. Now, I, I, let me talk just for a second about the whole idea of, of uh, listening to unwise counsel because every one of us, I, 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 we're going to talk about this here in a minute where we see a progression happening here. And it starts with listening to the wrong people. When, when you're walking and you begin to listen to the voices of those around you that you shouldn't be listening to, the advice of others that don't have a biblical word, world view, and we stop and we listen, we go, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And that can be a lot, a lot of people. That can be family. That can be friends. That can be teachers. That can be other leaders. That can be uh, social media. Uh, that can be uh, all kinds of places that we get information come from. It can even come from within your own head. When you're laying there at night and it's just like, and just God, your brain won't shut down and you're getting all kinds of weird ideas about, well, if I did this, I go there, I do this. With, and, and we have an enemy that's trying to speak into us. And we've got to be able to cut down those voices, shut down those voices. It starts with who do we listen to? 
Now, here's the progression that, that I want you to recognize in this text. It begins with walking, right? Walking, standing, sitting. Do you hear that? It's a, it's a person that is walking and listening, standing and doing, sitting and mocking. The Apostle Paul, he describes, when he describes a Christian life at one point, he describes it as a race. Run the race in such a way as to win the prize. He liked to talk in athletic terms several times. He does that. Run that race. Unless you're in a walking race, typically we run, right? And the writer of Psalm 1 seems to, to be saying here, I, I like this analogy, that a person who stops running towards God starts to walk through this life. And when you begin to walk through this life, you slow down in your pace and you're not really pursuing after God, delighting after God, meditating on his word. You're just kind of strolling through life. You now become more susceptible to listening to the voices around you. You're still moving forward. You still look Christianish a little bit, but you're starting to listen to those around you because you're not intent on the prize. You're not running towards your Savior. And then it progresses. I go from a walk to I stop. Now I go from just listening to now I start doing. Now I start doing the things of sinners, and I'm diving deeper into the unblessed life that God desires for me. Until then, I go from standing and doing to now I get comfortable in not being for God. I sit in the seat of mockers and scoffers. Now I begin to scoff at God. Well, I can't believe I ever lived that life. And I can't believe all you all that are living that kind of a life, y'all are crazy. And we begin to mock it. Sadly to say, I've seen this play out a number of times in a believer's lives because they begin to listen to the wrong voices. And they start down that progression. Walk, stand, sit. That's the progression of the unblessed life and that's why as believers, every one of us, we've got to stay on our guard and we've got to press on. Like Paul says, we've got to press on towards the prize. We've got to keep running because if we take our eye off the prize, we have an enemy that would love to take us out. Now, just like with the blessed life, the writer of Psalm 1 gives us a, an illustration, an analogy to help us wrap our minds around it with the, the tree. Uh, he does the same thing with the unblessed life with what's called chaff. All right. Verse four, again, the wicked are not so. They don't do any of those things. Actually, they do those things and they don't do the next things. But anyway, uh, but are like chaff in the wind that the wind drives away. Chaff is that husk that surrounds the seed, uh, seed of like wheat or corn. It's that just lightweight Trash. I mean, it's not worth anything. And, and you would see uh, uh, in the day where a farmer would have his uh, winnowing fork and he would throw the seed into the air and the wind would carry off the chaff and, and the seed would fall back down. Where all, when all was said and done, all he had was the seed, the good part, the meat of the plant, what he was hoping for, the fruit of the plant. And the writer here says, hey, the unblessed life, the wicked life, it's just chaff. It's just blown away in the wind. Right now, in my shop, we've got a bunch of pompous grass. And if you don't know what pompous grass is, uh, that's what it is right there. All right? This is the closest thing I have to chaff. All these little fluffy things are really pretty. But they go everywhere. All right, we've got them in there for our daughter's wedding because we love our daughter and we've worked to try to, you know, make it great. Uh, but, uh, but right now, these are hanging in my shop and little puffs of uh, pompous grass keep floating through my shop. <laughs> 
I love my daughter, all right? We're, I'm good with it, but it just keeps showing up, all right? Even though we've hairsprayed it, we've tried all the things they say to do, but it's still hanging there, and the wind comes into my shop, and it goes all over the place. That's chaff. It's, it's worthless. It just, it's pretty, okay? All right? It'll be great in the wedding, I'm sure, all right? But... Uh, but that's chaff. It just, it just blows. It just goes wherever the wind blows. Whatever the next teaching is, whatever the next philosophy is, that's where we go. That's what we're going to do. That's chaff. And that's the life of the unblessed person. Where does that kind of life lead to? Well, that's where he goes next in the text. Look at verse 5. It says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Uh, that's an interesting uh, scenario here. Therefore the wicked will not stand. Literally stand here means they will not rise. Meaning at the judgment, when they stand before God, the judge, they're not going to stand. They won't even be able to get off their knees. They stood with sinners in this life, but when they are before the judge, our God, he says they won't even be able to rise. They will be humbled. They're not going to stand before the judge and be acquitted of their sin because of the blood of Christ, because they've never received the blood of Christ. They never claimed the blood of Christ, or they've turned their back on the blood of Christ. He says they won't rise in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Meaning, right now, in this life, the blessed and the unblessed, the righteous, those made righteous through Christ, and the unrighteous, the wicked, those who have not received forgiveness of sin through Christ, those, we're all together, just like a wheat field. There's wheat growing up and there's weeds growing up all at the same time, but it's all going to get sorted out in the end. And at the judgment... The wicked, the unblessed, they will be separated from the blessed, from the believers. We will not be together any longer. And the text goes on to say, look at verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Just like chaff for the farmer. it will be blown away. Or it'll be, burn, it'll be gathered up and burned up. And that's, that's the end for the unblessed life. It says there in verse 6, God knows the way of the righteous. He knows the way. He's, he blesses the way of the righteous, of the, of the blessed person who's pursuing after him and delighting after him. But for the unrighteous, that un, unblessed person who hasn't claimed Christ and his for, forgiveness, they will perish. Let me stop here for a second because here's what I... My fear is that we could come across right now and say, stick it to him, God. That's what they deserve. And quite honestly, some in the church see it that way and preach it that way. That's not how I want us to see this today. That's a terrible end to an unblessed life. No, as a church, as a people, as God's people, it should be our intent, our desire to do anything and everything that we can to save those who are on the wrong path. Jude 23 says, snatch them from the fire. That's our mission. That's what we ought to, go, ought to be about as we love Jesus and love like Jesus as we're striving to reach out to those people who have not found Jesus, who are not walking in his way and only have a destiny of destruction in front of them because they've bought into the lie of what a real blessed life looks like. Their blessed life just looks like all the things this world has to offer that will one day burn up and be gone. We have something much better to offer in Jesus. So let me ask you this. Which path do you want to be on today? Which path do you want to take? The blessed or the unblessed? 
In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus was preaching a sermon, a lengthy sermon. And, and at Matthew 7, towards the middle of that chapter, he's kind of wrapping up the sermon. And he, he says, makes a statement here, gives an analogy. I think just goes perfectly with what we're talking about today. And, and he ended his sermon with it. I think it would be fitting to end this message with this text. It's not going to be on the screen. I just want you to listen. Maybe you even need to close your eyes and just listen to these words. This is Jesus speaking. He says this. There are two paths before you. You may take only one path. One doorway is narrow and one door is wide. Go through the narrow door. For the wide door leads to a wide path and the wide path is broad. The wide, broad path is easy. The wide, broad, easy path has many, many people on it. But the wide, broad, easy, crowded path leads to death. Now then, that narrow door leads to a narrow road that in turn leads to life. It is hard to find that road. Not many people will manage it. There's two paths. Which one are you on today? As a church, we should be doing everything that we can to put up signs, to point people, to do whatever it takes to get people pointed towards the narrow path to follow Jesus. Let's not stop. Loving like Jesus so more and more people can get on the right path. Father in heaven, we, we love you. And God, we thank you for your word. It is uh, it's truth. It is truth. It's firm, but yet, Father, it is full of grace. And God, it is my prayer that as your word goes out today, that it will penetrate hearts and minds, and that whether somebody listens to this message today, this week, ten years from now, may your word bring about change and lead people to follow you. So, God, I pray for everybody in this place and watching today. God, may you draw us to you. God, help us to delight in you, to delight in your word. God, help us to walk in your ways that we might experience the blessed life that you desire for us that begins in this world but is going to get so much better in the next. God, we look forward to that day. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.